Okay, how you fine folks doing? We're out here in a nice, uh, nice coastal sandy field out in uh, Essex County, Massachusetts. Right in front of us is uh, a nice member of the family, Asteraceae. I think I'm going to do just a general, you know, a general uh, uh, coverage of some of these nice late summer blooming Asters. You have an endemic, an endangered endemic one here on this location too. Liatris Nova Anglii that I'll be sure to show you. But right in front of you right now is a relatively common one. Um, Dolingeria umbellata, the parasol aster or white top aster. Um, smells quite pleasant, uh, really quite pleasant actually. Little bumblebee was hanging out on the thing a second ago. So as you can see, it's topped by this nice, uh, this nice inflorescence of white aster flowers. And of course, you got to remember, anytime you're dealing with asteraceae, you got to remind yourself, this is not one flower. Rather, this is an aggregate of many flowers masquerading as one flower. More on that in one second. I'll show you what the leaves look like on this guy. Really common species, you know down on the woodland edges. There are the leaves. Simple, alternate, entire, and uh, you know, somewhat scabbard is the underside. Nothing really to write home about, but they got a nice texture to them. Uh, these ones are pretty small, probably about three feet tall. You look over in the background there, over in the distance, you can see a couple that are getting quite a bit taller. Indeed, these do generally. There's one right there too. That's pretty tall. Indeed, these generally do get to be pretty, pretty big plants. Um, they like the forest edge. They're getting shade this time of day on this side of the field, and you won't see them over on the other side of the field, because I think they do like to get a little bit of that afternoon shade. I'll pull this guy down, hopefully. Actually, you know what? We'll be kind to the bumblebee, and we'll look at this one instead, because it's a better angle anyway. So as you can see, you get some of the white ray florets there. The white ray florets there on the edge, and then the disc florets there in the center. All these little things exerted. Those are the stamens, okay? I, I, I should do should have done a better job of explaining this last year, but I didn't, so I'm explaining it now. Uh, those are the exerted um, uh, pistils. So that's specifically, that's the style. That's the female, you know, part of the structure. And what happens is that female part of the structure, get the focus a little better there. That female part of the structure pushes up through, and you can see those are all individual little flowers there, individual little five-lobed flowers. Uh, it'll push up through five anthers, a little tube of five anthers called an anther tube, and it'll get all that pollen, you know, up there on the female part. Secondary pollen presentation, you get that in lobelias too. And just because, you know, we're going to do good aster etiquette here, there are those phyleries. So those are the little bracts that subtend this involucre. This entire thing here is known as a, <clears throat> as a capitulum. Might be a review for some of you, but it's a good idea to brush up on this every once in a while. Plural. Capitula. So this is obviously, you know, a pretty trademark aster flower you've got going on here. Still pretty early in the season for them. I remember taking a video of these guys, you know, in October. And it's actually funny. I didn't pay attention to them, really, you know, or give them, a, you know, all that fair of a shake when I saw them last year. But they're having a good year this year. Looking a lot better. Uh, last year... I was, you know, got them on video, you know, maybe October 1st, late September, and they were looking a little worse for wear. And just to remind myself, you know, let's get in there, let's see. Oh yeah, they do smell pretty good. These, these ones aren't as fresh as this one. I'm going to go off to the side here, get a whiff of this guy. Yeah, not, not the strongest floral smell in the world, but it is, it is pleasant. Stolangeria umbellata. Just looks like your normal white and yellow <clears throat> random daisy. Uh, but the whole family's got some pretty incredible morphology. And I think I'll go uh, 
Yeah, whatever. We'll go look at the rare one. Because there's a couple of... Um, one of its relatives is blooming nearby here that I can show you. So we'll, we'll go do that. Yeah, okay. Here, here's one that I really can't be sad. You know, anytime I come across it, I really can't feel all that bad and all that miserable. This is an endemic to, uh, you know, mostly coastal southern New England. You get it on Long Island. Uh, it is what it is. But basically, essentially, endemic to the sandy shoreline areas of uh, New England and Long Island. Uh, listed as vulnerable or endangered in every state that it occurs in, this is Liatris nova anglii. Got a little short out by now about this thing, so if you want to, you know, if you haven't already seen that, you can go find out a little bit about it in a minute, but we're going to get a little bit more in depth here. So this guy is an aster. You know, we just looked at it, but you'll notice he's got a little bit different thing going on with his morphology. Oh, sorry, Mr. Bumblebee. He scared me as much as I probably scared him. He's like drunk on the thing. Can you see him? See that guy right there? He's cute. I didn't mean to startle you, buddy. He startled me just as, uh, just as bad, but I digress. Um... So if you want to get, you know, I can do a brief synopsis of this. That, that, that already exists. It kind of, um, you know, checkers this field, you know, uh, unless you know what you're looking for, you can almost miss it. But they're, they're here, and there's quite a few of them. They were in bloom when I was here last week. They're still going to be in bloom now. And just by looking down at all of those buds, they will uh, continue to be in bloom for quite a while. Uh, if you missed it, I had uh, seen this guy on accident, not planning to see it, um, when I was uh, out in um, out in Western Mass. You know, just just one of them, not a field of them like this. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the co-occurring species that I've seen with this in other places, like Trichostema decatomum, which is a cool little mint, and then a uh, Saldago, uh, Nemoralis or Nemorosa, the field goldenrod, are not here. It's a different cast of species, including, you know, you've got some oak saplings that are growing up here. Um, there's a cool um, polygalaceae, the common one, it's polygalus sanguinea growing uh, right behind me that I can show you in a second, even though it's not an aster. It's just a generally cool plant. And of course, you got this guy. Um, did not do well in the drought here last year, doing significantly better this year. Get up into those flowers for you. So like any aster, it's got those, you know, those styles that poke out of the individual flower. As you can see in this capitula, those individual florets are a little bit big. And you get these elongated styles poking out. Still doing the secondary pollen presentation, although I'm guessing the pollen is nestled a little bit further back into the flower. Bring this down a bit, just to get a look at the uh, one of the uh, more immature flowers. Multi-seriate phyleries. Look at those bracts. They start down low, and you can see what's going on there. They just keep climbing up, keep climbing up the stem, and then eventually they form a little cup that all the flowers hang out in. Hang out in. Here's one that's just getting started. You know. It lets you really zoom in on one of those beautiful individual purple florets. It'd be nice even if it was by itself. How about that? So yeah, those are the styles poke flop flopping out. How lewd is that? Basically like shooting your cervix outside of your body. You know? Entire stem. It's covered in a fine pubescence, and I, I have to I have to say this: this is, you know, one of the more dry and sand adapted New England plants, but it's still not a xeric plant. It's still, it wouldn't do well in the desert. You know, it wouldn't do well anywhere out west. But as far as New England goes, it does favor the drier habitat types. We get out here, and the leaves are just, you know, these small. Oh, there goes that bumblebee. Small linear. Lanceolate, uh, not even, lan I guess lanceolate things. You know, no petiole, just kind of a press to the stem. And uh, not too friendly, kind of rough to the touch. So, back out a little bit on this guy for you. Give you an idea of the stature. Not a small plant, 
by any stretch of the imagination. But a really cool one. Some other ones kicking around here. Be a lot cooler, you know, if we had a, you know, Trichostoma dicotoma and Saldago nemorosa, nemoralis, whatever the hell it is here. But we don't. I got a couple Saldago species I'll show you on the way out. I got a, uh, oh, I didn't even talk about it. So, Eupatorii is the tribe here. Liatrini is the sub-tribe. But, uh, Eupatorii, that's, uh, in this, we'll just stick with tribe for this. I don't want to confuse you. The Eupatorii tribe is famous for having those really super long exerted stamens. A lot of them are white or purple. Um, a lot of them just have a you know, really cool form factor, attract a ton of bugs. Um, Stevia is one of the Eupes. Uh, Eutrochium, which are the Joe Pie weeds, and then you know Eupatorium, the, co the core genus of that tribe, um, are pretty prolific here. Um, both of those tend to be you know favor the wetter climate, white water habitats. So the, this being New England, we're you know not far from a little creek or a little a little wetland. And indeed, we are. I'll go show you one on the way out. Uh, but uh, yeah, just a really cool tribe within the Asteraceae subfamily. Or within, the, oh, I forget what subfamily they're in, but uh, I could put that there. Definitely Eupatorii tribe. Definitely one you should know if you live in New England. Um, even barring the fact that this is kind of not its usual, you know, habitat. It's still just a really cool plant. Let's go see what else we got. Okay, it's not an aster. Actually, these are, you know, distant relatives of the uh, pea family. It's in the order uh, Fabales, but this is Polygalaceae. This is um, specifically Polygala or Polygala. I hear people say Polygala. Uh, Polygala um, sanguinea. Sanguinaria, whatever it is. You can see down there, down at the bottom, this is where all the flowers have already finished up. And then up top, these ones are still going off. Polygalacia, I don't know if it's sister to Fabacea, but it's definitely in the order Fabales. But you'll note that it doesn't have, um, does not have compound leaves. Alternate, simple, linear leaves on this thing. Cool plant. There's some really, really cool ones. Um, like I forget, what do they call it? Gay wings? I forget the scientific name. I think it's another species of Polygala. So it's in the same genus. It's just a little bit more impressive. And that one's a spring bloomer. But uh, I caught these guys really, really late in the season last year, too, and um, didn't, didn't realize how late they were. And if I'm not mistaken, it gets that name. Do these guys bleed latex? I guess not. I have to look up the origin of the, of the uh, common name milkwort. I'm not sure where that comes from. Uh, but yeah, polyglacia is the family. Polygala. Sanguinea or Sanguinaria. Not usually, didn't usually see it with, uh, you know, I've seen it with asters in other locations, like, you know, with, with Saldagos and, um, you know, simply trichums, but not, not, not quite, us not usually in this type of habitat. So that's interesting to me, but we got a couple more things to show you. Hey, hey, right here, you can see some of these Liatris, they haven't even, you know, they haven't even started to bloom yet. I, I see that people are always like, oh, the peak bloom is, is, you know, like August. I mean, it's August right now, but like presumably earlier. I think these guys just got knocked back really hard last year. I'm not sure how well managed this plot is. I reported it to the state a couple times, but, you know, this guy's not even going off yet. And the ones I seen last year, uh, they didn't. But, I mean, this is just a really freaking nice day. I mean, I been having a what feels like a rough go of it but I know it's just relative and all things come to a pass but it's moments like this you really appreciate having areas like this to come out to after work just to just to fucking relax you know just to take the take the it takes the edge off you know anyway here's a real cool one another uh I'll just put this down all the way down another diminutive diminutive little guy here this is uh Lenactus linariafolia, going back to the daisy rays. You know, saw dog, uh, not saw dog, Liatris doesn't have those daisy rays. None of the Eupatori do. I don't know if I said that, but this is, you know, more closely related to the core aster group and Symphiotrichum and, you know, our, Ameri our so called American asters. Um, so, flax leaved aster is the common name for this. And I mean, you can see he's got nice white to blue to purple 
rays, little pink center. These are actually these are actually wrapping up pretty quickly. Flip this guy over. I would never deprive you of looking at the filaries. They get the little uh, little glands up near the tips. You see those little black specks. Some populations I've seen these will be mostly almost entirely white, and uh, the glands are a lot more prominent. But here they're almost purple, and they really don't have many of those glands. And then in any case, the leaves are just the tiniest little plasticky linear spikes. So pretty well adapted to the sand, to this fast draining habitat, to fast draining, fast le uh, leached habitat, nutrient poor, a number of things coinciding. And they don't get too big. They just kind of hang out along the ground. But those would be pretty attractive ground cover, you know, would be nice, nicer than a lawn. You just gotta have, you know, you go out, you live someplace sandy. You have to water often because your soil doesn't hang on to a lot of its water. This would be a great plant to have. Lancus linaria folia. Another one of these asters that are coming out to party as we're, uh, you know, getting into late summer. Although, I mean, I say that now. It feels like fall is on the air right now because it's probably, it's a very, very comfortable, maybe 70 degrees and obviously completely clear. But uh, mark my words, we'll get into September, hell, even October, and you start getting these days where it, you know, shoots back up to like, goddamn, I don't know, 85, 90 degrees. So this, this is the fall summer around Labor Day. I mean, what's today? The, the 22nd. So next weekend's Labor Day. You, you get this nicer weather this time of year, and then it completely, you know, does a 180 on you. You'll, it'll be like 60 degrees on Labor Day, and then you'll get into that first week of September. It'll hit like 90. Uh, and I, I've seen, you know, some Columbus Day weekends, you know, early on in October. Uh, it'll creep up on you when you don't want it, when you least expect it. But we're going to go look at maybe... A couple other things. I gotta show you a solid doggo and that eutrochium, but that's on the way out. I spoke too soon about tri about some of the co-occurring species. Here are two of them. They're really small and they're hard to see sometimes. In the mint family, Lamiaceae, specifically in the Ahugoidae subfamily, which is a really cool subfamily, the mint family. Not in, in full bloom, but there's a trichostema, dichotomum, coming out right now. Opposite leaves, which you can clearly see, definitely a mint family. And then this thing, if you can believe it or not, it's a Hypericum. It's Hypericum gentianoides, the pine weed, as it's commonly called. So these two you'll see pretty often growing alongside Liatristova anglii. Small little guys, though. Oh yeah, I spoke way too soon about Trichostema. There's a whole bunch of it down over here, which ironically I've seen a lot more of those small little, uh, small little, um, you know, liatris is over here. Can you see how it gets the name Blue Carls? That's a mint, baby. It's a real weird mint. Those are all the, uh, all the, um, the stigmas pouring out of it. Probably got a style somewhere there down there too. Yeah, there you go. Almost kind of reminds you of a, uh, well, I guess it's, you know, traditional Lamiaceae behavior. Oh, he was done. Was he? Oh, jeez. It's okay. It happens sometimes. It happens to the best of us. By the looks of it, most of these is done. Those are the little fruits setting. Or maybe they're just getting started. I don't know. I don't know nearly as much about the mint family as I should, but this one's a cool one. And we're just going to wrap it up real quick with a nice solid doggo. Just met a nice guy. Just literally right now. Funny how it happens. You're out taking pictures of plants. So you meet some cool people. He was telling me he thinks this one's Rugosa, which I, I'm entitled, I'm inclined to believe. Got the smaller, you know, capitula compared to most, and some rough, you know, some rough uh, lanceolate leaves with the dentate margins. Not friendly to touch. You can see this guy's just getting started for the year. One of the late bloomers. Some of these aren't even open at all. And then, of course, we come over here, we got a whole different situation going on. This, I believe would be Saudago Gensia. Flowers look pretty similar, but those leaves are doing a whole different thing. Not nearly as rough, not rough at all. Entire, rather lanceolate. And uh, 
just generally smaller. Different form factor too. You can see these guys will only flop over kind of in one direction. Yeah, this one's this one's done, but uh, you know this is a completely different phenology too. Yeah, solid doggo is a puzzle. You gotta you gotta embrace it, embrace the suck a little bit. But you'll note some of these are just barely getting started, while others are you know wrapping up for the season. Let me show you Eutrochium, and then I think I'll just about be out of light to film. Okay, there you go. There's your Joe Pie Weed, your Eutrochium. Also one of the Yoops with the uh, styles exerted there, I hope you can see. And uh, these guys have the, uh, you know, world, big whorls of, uh, you know, four to five leaves. This is the coastal plain species, Eutrochium dubium, I think it is. You also get Maculatum, you get Atropurpurea. I think you even get another one. Not too many species in the genus, and they're all pretty much restricted to the eastern half of North America. Pretty small genus compared to, you know, compared to Solidago. Even Liatris, you know, you're talking pretty close to 100 species, but this guy is not too distant of a relative. Purple with little, uh, little bug antennas seems to be a theme for that tribe, huh? Another one over there. These things can get massive when they have a good season. They're kind of getting shaded out here, I think, but, you know, you go over to some roadsides, all they need is a little bit of water and a whole lot of sun, and they just, you know, they'll go off crazy. This one's fortunately one while the people are coming around to planting it as an ornamental. But anyway, hope you got something out of that. Asteraceae is a wonderful family, frequently passed off as weeds, but more often than not, quite a few native species near you will be uh, members of this family. Anyway, I'm gonna go try and figure out probably in vain, what those uh, two solid doggo are. Definitely not the same species, but similar enough to get tripped up. Anyway, take it easy.